Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Can a prophet make a mistake in Revelation? Dr. Daniel Stone says yes. In our next conversation, we'll talk about William Bickerton's beliefs that yes, a prophet can make a mistake even in Revelation. Check out the conversation. I also want to remind you to please sign up for our newsletter. Go to gospeltangents.com newsletter and you can get the latest updates and find out some inside scoops. Now back to our conversation. William Bickerton, especially towards the end of his life, recognized that prophets were fallible. Even in during, I believe it was during the Civil War after, they, they, William Bickerton actually is the one to, even though he's the leading prophet of the church, other people can be prophets in the church, mind you. John Dixon is one that's considered to be a prophet, just to give an example. There are other prophets that could be recognized in the church. William Bickerton is the ordained leader of prophet, but other people, including women, can have this gift. Um, but he even institutes this within himself, because I think he sees the... the, the the, uh, the dissension that could potentially come out of this, and it kind of works sometimes to his favor, but it also backfires as well, where he says, okay, if there's a revelation, it needs, it, like a major revelation that's going to lead the church forward, it's actually supposed to go to conference or to a committee, and people are going to vote on it, whether they agree with it or disagree with it. And so it kind of puts some checks and balances on the prophet and his revelation. So very early on, he's, his, his, his people including him, are, can even recognize that men can make mistakes. It, even though they're considered a prophet of God, it is possible that a prophet can false prophesy. Wow, that's but very it, interesting. And that could just be from their own wants and desires. And even people in my tradition, I brought this up during a men's class one time Ooh. that I was teaching, and I tried to bring it up and saying, when we were talking about the gift of prophecy, I said, you know, there are, script, there are instances in the scriptures where prophets get it wrong, but they're still called prophets. I believe Nathan is one of them where he prophet. I'd have to look, because there, there is examples. And I bring up William Bickerton for one of them, Joseph Smith. I personally believe Joseph Smith, I, I, I'm a believer, so I will gonna, I'm going to take my academic hat off for a second and say, I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. Because you know, I have to believe in the Book of Mormon, which I do, to say that. But I think Joseph Smith might have let his mind get to certain things. And that's okay, because we read prophets in the Old Testament do that sometimes, quite often. Polygamy? Polygamy. Like, well, for instance, that's what I would consider, personally for me, I would say, an error. I feel like he maybe, that maybe could not have, that really wasn't something that God had wanted, because look at the, it just was not good. It really, it really split up the church. Now you're saying that as an academic. Is that a widespread belief among the Bickertonites? Oh, very much so. So I'll say that as a Bickertonites, Bickertonites totally believe. Mm, Bickertonites who believe that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy or the one that instituted it will say that that was a, a, a fault. There is a, a small cohort of people within the Bickertonites that still believe Joseph Smith didn't institute it. It was Brigham okay. Young. Despite the, the evidence and despite the hundreds of books written on it, they still think it was a... They haven't read the books. Yeah, they, they, they <laughs> just really, they really believe Brigham Young started it, which to mm-hmm. me, as a historian, I go, no, it, no was, it was totally Joseph Smith. Right. And we, that's, that, we don't want to talk about that. That's, oh, no. you, you have several people talk about that already. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's possible. So William Bickerton believed that prophets could make well, mistakes. And I, I also wonder if this was an institute because of Sidney Rigdon. Yeah, absolutely. You think that, that, that was a big influence on this. It policy? very well could have been. Yeah, it, it would have had to have been because jo- William Bickerton still believed that under Sidney Rigdon's authority, he got the, you know basically kind of like the keys to the kingdom, right? <laughs> so, but yet Sidney Rigdon fell away. Yeah, and that's what's interesting. During the Civil War in 1863 or four, I, during this time, Stephen Post. When William Bicker, once uh, Sidney Rigdon is starting his new church, the Church mm-hmm. of Jesus Christ of the Children of Zion, he tells Stephen Post in a letter, go out to the other Latter-day Saints that are in the West and try to get them to come back. So he's, he's trying to kind of gather a lot. of. He really wants Stephen Post to go to the reorganized church. That's, and, and he even tells, tells him, tell Joseph Smith III that he needs to join me because I'm the rightful successor. And if he doesn't, he's going to receive damnation. Oh my goodness. Well, Stephen Post, actually, before he goes out to the reorganized, he goes and visits the Bickertonites. And he kind of, and, and, and that was to Sidney Rigdon's uh, Instructions, but he wanted him to go to the reorganized first. And Stephen Post goes, "No, I'm going to go to the Bicker Tonight's first, and then I'll go out there." And Stephen Post actually meets with the Bicker Tonight's, and they talk. They even let Stephen Post uh, preach during one of the night meetings. 
But in the end, they basically say, yeah, Sidney Rigdon, sorry, we are, we received the keys. There was this revelation that was really foundational for the Bicker Tonight movement. In 1860, they have a, pro, a revelation that, um, I believe it was 1860, that uh, William Bickerton has this revelation that they're of the Church of Alma, that God is equating them to the Church of Alma. And that's really significant because what is the story of Alma in the Book of Mormon is Alma is a priest of Abinadi, right, who is a polygamist. And, and, Abinadi is a polygamist? Yeah, well, yeah, he has, he has, uh, he has uh, wives and concubines, it says. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not Abinadi, King Noah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> sorry, oh, Abinadi is the prophet. Yeah, yeah. so Abinadi, forgive me, so... A bit, um, I'm sorry, Alma, I'm getting mixed up. Alma is a priest of King Noah right. who has wives and concubines. So William Bickerton kind of equates that to, okay, who, William Bickerton was a elder under who? Brigham Young, who he looks at as having wives and concubines. And then he says that Abinadi comes and preaches and basically converts Alma, right? And Abinadi is burned at the stake. Well, William Bickerton kind of sees as God showing him that polygamy is wrong, calling him to this prophetic mantle, you know, showing him the vision of the mountain and chasm. And then he basically says, Alma basically starts this church from scratch in the Book of Mormon, right? And he baptizes converts. And William Bickerton sees himself as that. And in the early, in 1860, he has, he has, the church has this revelation that they are the church of Alma. So they basically tell Stephen Post when so he comes. Let me make sure I'm clear on that. So Brigham Young is King Noah. Yeah, Brigham Young is King Noah. William Bickerton is Alma. Is Alma. Is Sidney Rigdon Abinadi? N no, I don't think so. Sydney, yeah, Sidney Rigdon's not in that picture. We could even maybe say Joseph Smith is like King Zenith, you know, the person who brought them out there in the first place oh. to kind of, you know, p p purify them to get them away from the Lamanites. You can see all the similarities. Yeah, Sidney Rigdon, we could push him to the side in this, in this, in this, in this, in this you know, imagery. But eventually, yeah, so that's, they actually tell Stephen Post that. They say, well, we had this revelation that we're of the Church of Alma. So we're, even though William Pickerton takes his, you know, the laying on of hands, that the, the keys being passed from Sidney Rigdon, because of that foundational revelation of the Church of Alma, they basically say, we don't need you, Sidney. And Stephen Post, thank you for coming, but we, we're going to do our own thing. And they actually try to get Stephen Post to join them. They're like, no, we're the Church of Alma. Join us. Have Sidney come join us. William Bickerton's the new prophet, and that just doesn't. Sidney yeah. Sid Stephen Post is very polite in his, you know, his diaries and, and in his journals. He just says, you know, we just couldn't come to terms with that, and he just eventually goes off and tries to convert other Latter Day Saints. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> and that's all happening well, during the Civil War. And that was one of the parts that I really loved about your your book was this whole Church of Alma because I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. So William Bickerton is the modern day Alma. He feels it to see himself as. Hmm. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so, so he starts this new mission among the Indians mm -hmm. in, in Kansas, I believe, right? Yep, in Kansas. Not, not Missouri, but Kansas. And I know there's a big college football rivalry between those yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see that within the Vicar Tonight movement, too. Not with necessarily with the football, or is it basketball? I'm it's not sure. Well, it's kind of both, It's actually. both? <laughs> yeah. Well, because you have a whole, the whole bleeding Kansas thing. I mean, yep. there's like... There's a lot of Civil War type stuff between Kansas and Missouri. They just don't like each other. No, they don't. Well, because they're fighting for Kansas. As they're moving further and further west, people are, are trying to figure out, well, are we going to, you know, before the Civil War, are we going to allow slavery in the western territories? And, I mean, Kansas, that's where Bleeding Kansas comes from because you have people from both sides illegally voting <laughs> from the south and from the north trying to flood the polls to see if it'll become a, a slave state or a free state. And eventually mm -hmm. it becomes a slave state and then goes back to a free state and jumps around. So you see that constant fighting. The reason William Bickerton goes out to Kansas in the, uh, 1870, they, they start planning in the eight, early 1870s. They'll eventually, Bickerton and Bickerton and his group will go out will go out to Kansas in 1869, kind of like as an exploratory trip. They even meet Lewis Downing, who is the chief of the Cherokee tribe, and they're trying to kind of make inroads, and it's not that successful. But William Bickerton is adamant that they keep going out there. And after that 1869 trip, you start to see a lot of the, some of the Bickertonite, there's a small cohort of people there going, no, let's not go out there. They even, they even have some ideas of let's go to South America, let's, let's, let's make a colony there, let's go to Tennessee. And, but William Pickerton is gung-ho to get to Kansas. Why is, it, why is he so gung-ho about Kansas? Well, he has revelations that he's supposed to go to Kansas. But the main thing is Kansas is the edge of Indian territory. 
because back then there was Indian territory and he kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller as they're moving the Native Americans onto reservations. Well, he's trying to basically continue what Joseph Smith had started in 1831. Because remember, Oliver, he sends Oliver Cowdery and others out to Missouri to independence, which was back then in 1831, the edge of Indian territory. Once you got further west, that's where all the Native Americans were, or most of them. And that's where they're being you know, pushed by the federal government. Well, by the 1870s, they're now in west of Kansas or west of St. John, Kansas, or what will become first Zion Valley and then St. John. So that's why they want to get out there, is they want to continue what Joseph Smith had started, preaching to the Native Americans. Joseph Smith wasn't very successful with that. Neither was Brigham Young. And they kind of eventually just kind of give up, right? And they, well, William Bickerton doesn't want to give up and wants to continue. And that's the whole reason they're moving out there. And he wants to kind of create a communal society again. And the way they do it is interesting. They create this society called the Zion Colonization Society. It basically acts as a joint stock company where people will in the East can buy stock or in the, in the, in the colony, and people are going to donate their money to the, and sell what they have. And several people, several families move out there in 1875 to create a town in the middle of nowhere. So you have a bunch of coal miners and just blue-collar workers who've never been farmers, they're living in Pennsylvania, which is pretty much, I mean, it's in the Pittsburgh area. It's, it's civilization. It's a booming area to go to literally where there's nobody other than a few Native Americans potentially. That nobody has lived there. There's not even really any trees. They have to ship lumber from Chicago, and they have to build a town from scratch. So when William Bickerton gets out there in 1874, he basically blesses the land. He knows this is in the middle where tornadoes happen quite a bit. It's the prairie areas. It's all flat. So he blesses the land and actually asks that no tornado will ever ravage this area of the town of St. John. And believe it or not, in the 20th century, the Wichita Eagle actually writes an article, which I was able to include in the book, and they actually say... Since this blessing, no tornado has ever hit St. John. It's come close, but wow. they, it'll, it'll eventually it will turn or you know, go somewhere else. Wow. So since the 1870s, no tornado has actually recorded, has never that's hit St. John that's after that. Tornado Alley. Yeah, that's the middle of Tornado Alley. So still to this day, as far as I know, no tornado has ever hit that St. John wow. area. So pretty interesting. Yeah. So, and Willie Pickerton is eventually moving out there. It's in the middle of nowhere, and they actually do build a town, and they call it Zion Valley. And he keeps saying, this is where Zion is going to be or begin. But it's interesting. He never actually says this is where the new Jerusalem is going to be. We don't, I don't really know for sure whether, because we all know most of within the Latter-day Saint community, they believe the new Jerusalem is going to be built in Independence, Missouri. And William Bickerton actually references that in the Doctrine and Covenants. He knew the Doctrine and Covenants real well. And he even says in one of the newspaper articles, he says, you know, that was a blessed land according to the Doctrine and Covenants. But we see that they were basically, the, 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 the um, Latter-day Saints had to be kicked out of Missouri because of their transgressions. And that's what a Latter-day Saint, early Latter-day Saints believed. Even Joseph Smith talked about that a little bit. So he says, because they weren't faithful... We are going to create a new stake of Zion, he calls it. So he never actually says it's the New Jerusalem. I don't know for sure whether William Bickerton believed the New Jerusalem was going to be built in Independence or just somewhere in the Americas. It just seems like maybe potentially somewhere in the Americas. But at least within Zion Valley, which eventually becomes St. John, Kansas, he believes that that's going to be a major stake of Zion. He calls it the gathering place. So he really believes that they're going to create a communal society. They're going to pre- it's, a, it's kind of a launching point into Indian territory so they can find the choice seer. They can preach to the Native Americans and kind of get Zion moving and the gathering to happen. And that's what they're trying to do. But very quickly, it goes nowhere because not so much that they weren't successful. These coal miner blue-collar workers actually built a town in the middle of nowhere. They were very successful early on. But the church cut funding because there were several people in the East that said, we don't want to go there. And one of the leaders of the Zion Colonization Society, John Nish, goes there, basically gives a report. Bickerton thinks everything looks good. According to William Bickerton's account, John Nish was like, yeah, everything looks pretty good. He goes back East and says, guys, it's terrible. (laughs) It's a horrible wasteland. We should not be colonizing here. So after two checks, you know, because the East are supposed to at least help them keep them afloat until they can get the first harvest in. They cut off after two checks. And the Kansas saints that move out there have to go through a Kansas winter with very little money. 
and they almost basically starve and freeze to death. Wow. I don't know if there was any deaths. It doesn't seem that way. But William Pickerton said, he said, I thank God for buffalo chips because we were able to sell those and burn those for heat and make some extra cash. Well, so basically means they were burning buffalo poop to, to, <laughs> and selling buffalo poop to stay alive. So it wasn't the best circ- of, of circumstances. Wow. William Bickerton even says he nearly froze to death. So it was hard. It was harsh. In the end, the church eventually does come back together, and they eventually put a lot of effort into Zion Valley. But at this time, when Zion Valley becomes prosperous, a lot of other Americans are hearing about it because people are constantly moving west. So this religious colony that was supposed to eventually be a launching point to the Native Americans becomes secularized because of the fact that it's so prosperous. During the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, the state of Kansas actually uses some of the wheat from Zion Valley on their display because it's so hardy, and that's what the Bickertonites are planting. Oh, wow. So people are, it's kind of like an advertisement. So a lot of other you know, Gentile Americans are, are moving there, and the Bickertonites and these Gentiles eventually create the town of St. John together. And William Bickerton doesn't seem too uh, upset about this because he still sees it as a launching point to the Native Americans. Hmm. But it really kind of disheartens some of the people in the East, including this man named William Cadman. But in the end, from, from the documents, the, the Bickertonites shot their own selves in the foot. Yeah. So this communal society that could have potentially maybe existed, we don't really know. It just goes nowhere. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone. In our next conversation, we'll talk about an amazing miracle performed by William Bickerton. She was on her deathbed. She's this young woman in her 20s. She's married, and she has children, and she's on her deathbed, and all these people are in her home, and she's basically, in her weakest moments, basically telling people goodbye, and she's very briefly kind of trying to help, say, well, this is what to do with the children. She thinks she's going to die, and Bickerton's there, and he's really distraught. He goes to the creek to pray, and in this moment, when he's at the creek, he feels in his spirit, go back there and tell her she, she's healed. So he goes into the room very boldly and says, do you believe that Jesus can heal you? And she says, yes. And he says, well, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up. And according to the account, it says that she got up instantaneously and was healed off of her deathbed. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for Gospel Tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com slash shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our Apple podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.